Welcome to Harvest Mission Community Church. You are listening to one of our sermons. Talking about new intimacy. And I really believe that this is what ties everything together. If you see uh, the chapter and the reflection, you see the Bible intake, the inspiration, you see the goals as pillars of what's going to help us go into this next year in a healthy way, then intimacy is really the glue that holds everything together. And we want to make sure that all these things that we're doing, it doesn't become just behavior modification, doesn't become another list of tasks to do, but it's integrated with our relationship with God so that in everything that we do, we could do it for God and in a way that allows us to help us to trust in Him. So we're going to look at a psalm today, Psalm 63. It's a psalm of David, so you can turn to it and uh, just leave your Bible there uh, or on your phone. Uh, Also in the mobile app, we'll have the sermon notes available so you can follow along in that with the verses and a couple passages there. Uh, But as we first talk about intimacy, I think just the whole concept of intimacy, I mean, there are a lot of different ways that we can interpret this. We all have different ways of experiencing intimacy. We all have different aspects of intimacy we, the, that we value. And so I wanted to get a, a quick feel for how many of you see intimacy in our church and how you see that in your own relationship. So we're going to do a Mentimeter. And so it's going to be a little bit interactive. You'll notice that on the screen uh, in front of you, there will be a code. You go to menti.com and then you want to go to that code and type in that code so you can get access to that. So the QR code is on the screen. Uh, go to bit.ly slash 17 Jan Menti and you'll get access to that. And as soon as you get access, you can start answering the question because there's a little bit of a delay before you can actually see the results on your screen through the, uh, through the stream. And I'm going to ask us a couple questions and ask you just to note some of the responses and see how our church really views intimacy uh, in, in, in our relationships in our lives. So the first question here is, what do you think are the three key characteristics for intimacy? What do you think are the three key characteristics for intimacy? And so what you'll do is uh, once you log on, go to menti.com, use the code. It's 3207591. And then you'll just put in the first three words that come to mind. And it'll come up with a word cloud. And so if you haven't already, go ahead and make sure that you uh, put in that URL. Join on your mobile phone. I know some of you are Zooming with your life group. So use another device if you have it. And then put down the three key characteristics for intimacy that you want. Okay, and so some of us, all right, we have uh, love. We have uh, vulnerability. I see trust there. Uh, Someone is... uh, I guess someone really loves Grady. Uh, see Grady there. And so uh, that's great. We have honesty, vulnerability, communication, understanding, care. I think these are really great traits about intimacy. And I think a lot of it has to do with just a give and take in relationships. A give and take in relationships that will really allow someone to experience love, mutual love, across both sides. So that's great. Uh, Let's move on to the next question. It says, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being highest, how confident do you feel in being able to develop intimacy? How confident do you feel in developing intimacy? So I'll read it one more time. It says, on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being highest, how confident do you feel in being able to develop intimacy? So one is like not confident at all. I have no idea. I struggle a lot with intimate social relationships. Others of us are 10, uh, and you're like, I'm very confident. Uh, if you uh, put me in a room with a stranger, I can get to know them really, really well, and we can be best friends after we're done with that hour. You know, I've done that quiz where you ask 39 questions to fall in love, and yeah, I'm, I, I know all those questions by heart. So let's see. Oh, well, we have uh, about 6.2 is an average. We have a lot of people who are sevens or eights, a couple people who are 10. Praise God for all the tens. We have a couple people on the low side, about one or two or three. So we have a wide spectrum of people and they're just their confidence and, and being able to develop intimacy. And it's actually getting lower as uh, more people respond. So it's about 5.8 now, I think, or so. 
All right, so let's, uh, the third question is, what do you think are the three best ways to develop intimacy? And I know that you put characteristics before, and those are traits, but in the process of actually developing it, what are the best ways to develop it? Not just the traits, not just the signs of it, but what are the three best ways to develop intimacy? Um, and so what do you have to do? Like, what, what, what activities, what do you have to initiate or put yourself out there or what has to happen in order for people to develop that kind of intimacy together so again put your name it's going to be another word cloud there so it could be just a word could be a couple phrases there so I see some people already inputting their answers so uh, interesting I, I think communication is really coming out which is which is great I, I'm, I'm thankful that many of you know that communication is so so important and time Time is the other one that I see that's really popping out. Trust, uh, care. I see a lot of people are looking to the five love languages, like quality, time, touch, uh, service, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff I think is really, really important. Being vulnerable again, uh, shared experiences. I think those are all really, really great things. And this is the last question. Just on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being highest, how would you rate your intimacy with God right now? How would you rate your intimacy with God right now? So we've talked about how well, the characteristics for intimacy, uh, our confidence in developing intimacy, the best ways to develop intimacy, and as well now, just being able to rate ourselves, rate our own intimacy with God right now, uh, right in this moment, in this season of your life as we start the new year, and uh, just share a little bit. Uh, just anonymously, but we can get a general feeling for uh, where our church is. I see a lot of people at five, which is <laughs> the safe answer, right? You're neither bad nor good. It's the safe answer. You're neither proud nor super uh, insecure <laughs> about where your relationship with God is. We're right at that 5.5 mark, and we see that bell curve. Some of us are doing really well. We're at that 10. Uh, we just had this amazing time with God with worship. Let's praise God for the worship team. God is, is really using them. Some of us are on the other end. I see a, a, a little spike in uh, the ones and twos and threes, uh, even the threes and the fours. And so I, I think this is uh, not surprising. Uh, even though many of us, I would say when we rated ourselves on how confident we feel in being able to develop intimacy, our average was higher and many money. Many more of us were more confident that we could develop intimacy. But when it really comes to show, when we actually evaluate our own relationship, our, our own intimacy with God, it reveals a lot about where we're at. And even though we might think we know, or we might claim that we know how to develop intimacy, it doesn't translate into our intimacy with God. And I think this is really the issue that I want to talk about this morning as we get into this message is what is our intimacy with God, and is that where we want to be? And is that in a place that is going to help us as we look forward to this year in 2021? We can have all the goals that we want. We can have all the, the Bible reading that we want. We can have all the, the reflection and meditation and remembrance of you know, what, what things happened in the last year, all that we want. But if we're not intimate with God, then all those other things will mean really little for us in this coming year. I mean, when you think about 2021 and you think about the skills that we need in order to face this new year, I, I, some of you might be like, praise God, 2020 is over, 2021 is here, everything's going to be better. But many of you know, even with the first two weeks of the year, that doesn't, just because the year changed, doesn't mean everything has switched over. Um, I was looking through social media and I came upon uh, this meme uh, about 2021 or 2020 and 2022. Uh, this is a, a pattern. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but 1938, 1939, 1940, 1941, there's a pattern. And that same pattern is 2018, 2019, 2020. And not saying that something is going to happen in 2021, but we're sorely mistaken if we think that all of a sudden 2021 is going to be this beautiful year. And this wonderful time, and many of you know, and it's not just because of 2020, it's not just because of the pandemic, but as life goes on, life just gets harder. Life gets more difficult. Amen, married couples, 
families, amen, single adults, to all you college students, it's going to be harder as you get older and as life goes on. And so that's the question is, do we have intimacy that's going to get us through and that's going to bind everything together and that's going to help us to flourish in our walk and our spiritual relationship with God this coming year? And that's why I want to give us the one thing for this morning. The one thing is that intimacy with God through prayer provides the power to overcome anything we encounter. Intimacy with God through prayer provides the power to overcome anything that we encounter. And I want to give us uh, just a brief time in huddle groups. We'll have a couple of them throughout just the time. I'm going to give us a little bit of a shorter huddle groups so that we can split out more frequently. And what I want you to do is just talk for just four minutes or so, and I'm just going to give you one question to talk about, is what are some key characteristics of intimacy in a relationship? And you mentioned, and you already answered that question on the Mentimeter, so hopefully it shouldn't take that much time to think through it. Just share from your own perspective, what are the key characteristics of intimacy in a relationship that are important to you? Talk about that. I'll give you, again, four minutes. We'll come back and we'll look into Psalm 63 as we look into David's life. I wanted to give us three components that are going to be crucial as we look at Psalm 63. We look at David's response uh, to just the situation that he was in that helps us to develop a new intimacy that we didn't have before. And I really pray that we will have a brand new intimacy with God that we've never had before in our lives this coming year. And the three are going to be deeper intimacy, wider intimacy, and longer intimacy. So we look at the first point, which is deeper intimacy. I'm going to look at this first point. Uh, and talk about deeper intimacy. So let's first just read this first verse, Psalm 63. Hopefully you've turned to it, and let's just read uh, the first verse together. It says, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. O God, you are my God, and earnestly I seek you. One of the things that we noticed, very interestingly, was we just stopped there, is that David just opens up this psalm by saying, O God, you are my God. doesn't say, the God doesn't say the Lord Almighty, heaven's armies on earth. He says, my God. And there's so many ways that in other Psalms, David calls God by different titles. But in this particular one, because in this Psalm, the context is that he's in the wilderness. He's in the desert. He's running away from an enemy. And he says, oh God, you are my God. He's addressing God as his God. And, and he's addressing him as an And interestingly enough, he's not only telling us that he's addressing him as my God, but he's addressing this to God. This is his prayer. He's saying, oh God, you are my God. And it's it's not like God needs to be told that he is David's God. It's not like, you know, the only thing I can think of is like Star Wars, Darth Vader, right? Saying, Luke, I am your father. And Luke is like, no, right? And he's like, no, it's not like a new revelation for Luke. In that sense, it's not a new revelation for God. God knows. But for David to use a phrase like that shows something about the depth of his intimacy with God. Let's look into that. And and why is that word my so important? And there are three different uses of the possessive word my. And I made this up. It's not in the grammar books or anything. But there are just three categories that we as uh, humans and in the English language that we use my to describe. The first is a simple possessive. Simple. So whenever you use my in a simple way, it's just my pen or my book or my phone. It's something that you own. It's something that you uh, have for yourself. The second one would be an associated possessive. It's something that you are related to or you belong to, an organization or a club. You would say my university or my workplace or you know my dance club, whatever it might be, because you're associated with it. And then one more way that we typically use this word my is what I would call a relational possessive. And we usually use this for things that are very dear and close to us. Uh, We talk about our family this way, my dad, my mother, my siblings, you know, my, my dreams, my hopes, my wishes. Why? Because they're very personal to us. And what I'm proposing is that David used the relational possessive, the most intimate form of my when he was talking about my God. 
It wasn't saying I own God. It wasn't my God I own. It wasn't I just am associated with God. But it was, no, God is my God in a deep and an intimate way. And we see this all throughout Scripture, the Israelites and their special relationship with God. They were considered God's special people. In Exodus 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 6 to 7, uh, we'll read the highlights together in the yellow. It says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And read it together. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And there it is. We see it right there. I will take you to be my people. This is God speaking. So it's not only the people speaking to God, but it's God to the people. You are my people, and I will be your God. The Israelites, they had a special covenant relationship with God that no other people, no other nation had. It was special. It was intimate. It was relational. It wasn't just the Israelites. It was Jesus himself. Jesus himself had this personal, intimate, special relationship with God. We see this in Matthew uh, chapter 27, verse 46. And this is right as Jesus is on the cross. He's dying. He's suffering. And this is right about right before he's about to die. And then uh, verse 46, it says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he doesn't just say it once. He says it twice. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the cry of not someone who says, God, the one that I am associated with, that's not the cry of someone who's saying, God, the God that I own. It's, it's the cry of my, my God, my Father, the one who has protected me, the one who has been with me the whole time, the one that I am close with, the one that I'm most intimate with. My God, that is my God. That is the relationship, and that is the context that Jesus is using, my God. And the reason why this is so significant, and the question for us is, do we see God and do we have that level of intimacy with God? Do we have that level of depth in our relationship with God? I think one thing that uh, I often catch people saying, or actually when, when, when we're planning any kind of church stuff or we're in life group and people have some questions about announcements, you know, especially if you're new, if you're joining us for the first time, oftentimes you know, I'll hear people say, hey, uh, when are you guys doing X, Y, and Z? And you know, for those people who are new, I totally understand. But once in a while, I'll catch people who have been part of our church for a long time. They've been committed. And they'll ask me, like, when are you guys doing blank? And I, I, just, I do like a double take. I'm like, what do you mean you guys? Are you not <laughs> involved in this? Are you not part of this? Is this not your church? Is this not your community? I'm wondering if so many of us or many of us, whether it's just a use of the English language or maybe a slip of the tongue, but when we look at our church community, well, definitely it's not the simple possessive because you don't own the church, right? Pastor Seth, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's not Pastor Seth who owns the church. God who owns the church. But many of us, we just use the church in that associated possessive way. Like, oh, I, I'm just associated with this church. Or because I'm a Christian, I guess I could say that's how I'm associated with the church. But it's still kind of you guys, you, you leaders, you pastors who are owning this church. When's the last time you said, my, this is my church, in a relational, possessive way, that this is my church, my community, my family? Many of us are really uncomfortable with that. And I'm going to challenge us, for many of us, we, we hold ourselves back, there's a distance, it means you haven't really developed an intimate relationship with the community around you. You haven't really committed yourself. You haven't put yourself out there. Many of us are complaining like, oh, why don't I feel connected with this church? Is this really the church for me? I'm wondering if it's because you haven't put yourself out there to develop the intimacy with the other members of the church that you know how, that you know in other relationships that you can do that. You haven't taken that step to take experiencing membership to be a covenant signing member. You haven't taken that step to serve, to take experiencing ministry and to serve on a ministry team where you can get to know other people and you can develop in your relationship with God. And the saddest thing is the reason why I'm talking about intimacy in the, in the church context is because it's really revealing about our intimacy with God. 
In the same way, we wouldn't use that simple possessive way to talk about my God, because you don't own God. Maybe some of us, we talk about the associated possessive. You say, oh, because my God, because I'm Christian, I, you know, I'm associated with God. And I would say very few of us use the relational possessive to say, my God, my God, just as Jesus did on the cross. How many of us, we say, God, you are mine and I am yours. How many of us, we have that relationship with where in our prayers it comes out. And this is the best way you can tell the depth of your relationship with God is through your prayer life. What kind of language that you use, what kind of expressions that you, what do you talk about? Um, one thing that I, I had to learn about intimacy, and I, I think all my life I'm really, really not a, not a person that naturally like, loves sharing and has relationships, but after I started dating, and then after I started getting, uh, after I got married, uh, I had to learn a lot <laughs> about intimacy. And uh, you can ask my wife; she knows about how. Like when I come home, I'm not the type of person just to come down and start sharing about my life, right? I'm not the type of person to say, "Hey, this is what happened in my day, and it was so great." And these are the things I'm struggling with. Like for her, it's really natural. I mean, she's just a very loving person. She's just naturally relational. But for me, I'm just like a wall. Like, hello, like, are you there? You know, like, talk, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I realized, like, as we were getting closer, and even, you know, after we were married, it still takes some time. As we were developing that intimacy, I realized something started to happen. And I, I don't know when it was. I, it was early on in our marriage, but I came home one day, and I just felt this urge to share. It was like the weirdest thing. I was like, hey, I want to tell you how my day was. I want to tell you all the good things that happened. I want to tell you what I'm struggling with. And, and I started to, and I look back and I started to realize as I grow in intimacy and I grew in intimacy with my wife, it just caused me to want to share, want to talk, want to relate all the things that were going on in my life with her. And I realized the same principle applies even to our relationship with God. That if our prayer lives are all about what we want, it's all about what we don't have, if all of our prayer lives are all asking God for stuff, then that shows the superficial nature of our intimacy with God. If all you do every single time you pray is, God, please give me this, please give me that, I need this GPA, I need this raise, I need this deliverance, those are not bad prayers. But if that's the only thing that you ever pray, what does that show about you and God? Many of us, we see God as taskmaster, so every time we come in prayer, we feel guilty. Why? Because we're like, God, God, I didn't do this. I didn't do my soap. I, I didn't, you know, serve in the way that I was supposed to be. What does that show about our relationship with God? It shows that you view, view him as, as a taskmaster. You're not intimate with him. You're not connected with him. And why is it f so hard for us to have that prayer life? It's because we're not intimate. It's because we don't know God. It's because we're not connected with him. It's because we see him as this far off master it's because, we, it's because maybe our, our family lives, because our fathers were like that. And it really influences how we see God. But God is completely different. In John 15, 5, in the ESV, it says, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. Read it together in the yellow. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. The amazing thing is that it's not us that has to take the first step of developing that intimacy. God already took that first step. You had no right to speak with God. In fact, you deserve, the, you deserve to be as far from God as you possibly can be because of your sins, because of how you run away from Him, because of how you disobey Him. But still, Jesus, God through Jesus says what? I've called you friends. And everything that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. And this is not an amazing truth, an amazing hope that God wants to meet us. God wants to tell everything about Him to us. And He wants us to share about our lives with Him in every context so that we can go deeper with God together. My hope and my prayer is that we can discover and understand this more in our lives. What is it that we're holding against God? What are the ways that we pray? How are the ways that we pray revealing about how we view God? I want to give us a huddle group time.
uh, just to answer this question, and, and just briefly to talk about why do you think developing a deeper intimacy with God is difficult for many people? Why do you think it's difficult for yourself to develop that deeper intimacy, to have those deeper intimate conversations and connect with God? And the other thing I want us to do is I'm going to give us six minutes and I'll give you three minutes just to answer that question. And then with the other three minutes, what I want you to do is actually pray for one another. And I know this might feel a little bit awkward, but I want you to pray for each other to have a deeper intimacy and I want you to address God as my God. So it's going to be both awkward for you and awkward for the other person, but I really want us to exercise this because I feel like so many of us, we just don't have that kind of intimacy with God. We don't, we've never said, God, God, you are my God and I'm your, I'm your servant, I am your child, I am your friend. And I want us to practice that right here, right now so that we can develop, take that first step in developing that deeper intimacy. So again, six minutes, you need someone in your breakout room to be the timekeeper. So once it's three minutes is up, say, hey, we got to stop, sh stop sharing. Just go around. Hopefully your huddle groups are a little bit smaller so that everyone has time to share and then use the last three minutes to pray for one another. So go ahead and do that and we'll come back. All right, well, let's come back and hopefully you had some good time of not only sharing but also ministering to one another in prayer. And I know many of you might feel like, wow, that was so awkward. Uh, and, and hopefully my prayer is that one day it won't be so awkward for you to say, God, you are my God and, and you are so dear and near to me and that your intimacy will go deeper. And so let's move on to the second point. So not only do we need a deeper intimacy, but we need a wider intimacy, not only a deeper intimacy, but also a wider intimacy. Let's read, uh, just finish off the first verse and read through verse four. So 1b through uh, verse four and it says, here it says, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. So we see here, uh, as David describes a little bit more of his situation, we notice that he is in a difficult time. Uh, I earlier mentioned that the context is that he's in the wilderness, and he says it right here. He says, as in a dry and weary land where there's no water. And so he must be in the desert or the wilderness somehow, and he's running away from an enemy. And curiously, in verse 2, he responds by saying, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. I want to read that in a couple different translations. In the New Century Version, again, read it together in the yellow, it says, I have seen you in the temple. I have seen you in the temple. And the, and the temple in that moment was the temple in Jerusalem. That was where David was king. That's where the temple of God was. That's where people would go to gather to commune with God because the Israelites knew that God's presence was in the temple, in the sanctuary, in the Holy of Holies. That's where you went to communicate with God. And David is going back to say, man, in those days I have seen in the Amplified Version, it says, So I have gazed upon you in the sanctuary. Again, he's saying, I have gazed upon you. Not only has he seen, but he's gazed with this amazement. He's been in awe. He's had this experience, this deep, powerful encounter and meeting with God that most people probably haven't been able to have. And I think the important part, and we notice even these verses when you look through verse 1b all the way through 4, is he's saying, I am in a dry and weary land, but yet, so I have looked. It was in a past tense. And the key is that David is no longer there. He's no longer in the sanctuary anymore. He's in the wilderness. He's, he's longing for that time that he was in deep communion with God. And I think this is the challenge for us, is that many of us, we are in David's exact same situation. Many of us, we're in the wilderness. We're outside of the temple. We're outside of Jerusalem. We're outside of the sanctuary. And we're longing for those times that we had in that communion with God. We're longing for those in-person church services. We're longing for encounter in person. We're, we're praying, Lord, let the conference be in person. And I'm praying for that too. I'm praying that the, the cases we're going on, let's pray together for that so that we can come together safely and with the right precautions. But many of us are longing for that. Many of us are longing for the retreat that we had two years ago. 
You've been part of our church for long enough. For those of you who haven't never been to our church, our retreats are wonderful. They're amazing. It's just powerful. It's transformative. Many of you remember Pastor Dave when he came, just preached, brought God's words, and, and I remember it, just lives were transformed. We saw so many testimonies come out of that time. People received Christ. And I, and I remember just so many people who their lives are so impacted by that moment. They're like, man, I long for that time, and I wish I could go back to that moment. Some of us are like, man, I wish I could go to another missions trip right now because it was so good. We haven't had a missions trip for two years. And those are the things that we go back to. And there's nothing wrong with relishing in it. There's nothing wrong with longing for that. But the truth and the fact of the matter is, you're not there right now. We haven't had those experiences for two years. And because you're banking on those experiences, you're banking on those testimonies, then your, your soul is withering right now. Your intimacy with God is drained. You have no life. And, and you're waiting for that next hit. You're waiting for that next, almost like a drug, you're waiting for that next shot where you can somehow get this powerful experience with God, but you're waiting for all of that, but you haven't been able to get that. And I think this is the, the problem. This is the, the difficulty with us in our prayer lives is that our prayer lives are so narrow. They're so narrowly focused on the physical presence. Where they're fo- so f- narrowly focused on the location you know, can you imagine if David, the only way that David could connect with God was in the temple in Jerusalem? That means anytime he was in the wilderness, when he was suffering, there's no way that he could connect with God. And for so many of us, our relationship with God and our prayer lives end where the walls of the church building end. And then when we go about our days, when we go to our workplaces, when we're with our families, when we're at home, now that we're, you know, working from home all the day and we just sit in front of our screens all the time, you know, life groups, even over Zoom, it's just not the same. And we just feel like our spiritual lives is just not the same. But then when we get to retreat, then we're like, ah, yes, it's prayer time. Oh, yes, it's ministry time. Yes, I get to experience God. But when was God limited by a specific location? Since when was God delimited to a particular location, a place? John 4, verse 21 through 23 This is Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman. And uh, the Samaritans, what they believed in in their synchristic uh, theology, they believed that there was a specific location where their ancestors worshipped, that that was the place they had to go to meet God. And what Jesus comes and speaks is not only revolutionary for her, but it's also revolutionary for all of the Jews and all of his disciples. And this is what he says. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But the hour is coming and now is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, it's not going to be on a location. It's not going to be in Jerusalem. It's not going to be on this mountain. It's not going to be any place. It's going to be wherever the Father is. And where is the Father? He is in the Holy Spirit. And where is the Holy Spirit? He is with you. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. He is with us. He is within us. So anywhere that we are, where the Holy Spirit is, that we are with God. And that's where we can worship. That's where we can pray. That's where we can connect with God. You cannot blame your prayer life on a structure. Well, some of us are like, oh, yeah, our church is too structured, and that's why I've never learned to develop an intimate relationship with God. That's such a, a, a poor excuse. You spend Sunday afternoon, Monday, Tuesday during the day. You might have life group on Tuesday evening or Wednesday evening. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, on your own, in your workplaces, in your classrooms, in your homes, with your family. You have so much time to be able to develop a relationship with God on your own. And you cannot blame your lack of intimacy with God on a structure that the church provides. Can you imagine if you said, man, I wish we didn't have that powerful powerful retreat so that my life wouldn't get transformed so I'd be forced to develop a personal relationship with God. You know how crazy that kind of logic is? Man, I wish wish we didn't have soap. I I wish we didn't have LCG accountability so that I would have to fumble and, and... and do all these things so I didn't do stuff on my own, so I would have to learn how to do it on my own. What kind of logic is that? It is your responsibility. No one else can develop a personal relation with, you, with God for you outside of the confines or the structures of the church. 
As a church, we're going to do whatever we can. Your community, your LCGs, your leaders, we're going to do whatever we can to help you build a relationship, a foundation with God. But it is your responsibility to translate that into every other area of your life. You cannot blame it on anyone else. And I think the best evidence for widened intimacy with God is what David does in verse 4. He says, So I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. The best evidence for a widened relationship with God, not one that's very narrow based on location, but a widened relationship with God is if you can praise God no matter where you are. Is if you can praise God anytime, anywhere, with anyone. If you can do that, then I think you're on the right track to developing a deep and a wide intimacy, a relationship with Him. And this is really true. Uh, in, uh, there's a book called The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. And it's a very interesting book. It's, it's written from the perspective of the devil, of Satan, who's trying to tempt Christians away from following God. But he expounds a lot of great Christian principles through that dynamic. And this is what he says in uh, one of the chapters. He says, and he's, uh, it's, this is again, this is the voice of the devil talking to another devil called Wormwood. So this is what he says. Do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will. So he's saying, no longer desiring God, but still intending to do God's will. He looks around upon a universe from which every trace of him, him being God, seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken, why he has been forsaken by God. And he still obeys. And he still praises. He still obeys. He still praises. That is the definition of a widened and a deeper intimacy with God. Is when you, you don't feel him. You're not physically there. It wasn't because other people were calling you and reminding you. It wasn't because that, that amazing retreat. It's because you're just with God. You know God is with you. You've experienced him. But even though you're not there anymore because you're committed to chasing after God no matter what your situation is, no matter what your feeling is, then you still obey and you still praise. Some of us, we equate intimacy with feeling, and that's such a, that's such a slippery slope. Because intimacy is not just about feeling. It's about this commitment to say, God, no matter where you're at, no matter where I am, I want to praise you because of who you are. I want to challenge us. Many of us were like, God, yeah, I, I don't know how to develop an intimacy. I, I'm not sure what to do. My first challenge to you is start praying outside of church. And I'm not talking about your 10-second prayers for the meal. Like, Lord, thank you so much for this food. Amen. I can't wait to eat. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about praying on the MTR. Praying as you're commuting to work. Praying as you're about to go meet with your friend. Praying before you go to your office or before you... You know, some of us, this is what we do. Like, because everything's work from home now, we don't have the commute times. You know what we do before our meeting? We wake up one minute before. Like, and everyone can tell, oh, this is how you look on the screen. <laughs> you know, those of you who are ministry teams, you know what that's like. Uh, maybe for some of you, that's how you join your classes. That's how you, I hope that's not how you join your work meetings. If that's the case, then Lord have mercy. But get up. 10 minutes earlier and pray before your work meeting, pray before your class, pray before your ministry team meeting to say, God, I want to connect you, not just in the structure that I have, but in every area of my life. Because God, you're everywhere. You're the, the Holy Spirit is in all places and you're within me. And that's why I can praise you. And prayer really starts from this deep, intimate relationship with God. And as we widen it, that's how we're going to praise him no matter what the situation is. So I'm going to give us one more last huddle group. And in this huddle group, I'm going to, give, again, give you one question and then use the other half of the time to pray. So again, six minutes, three minutes to discuss, three minutes to pray. And you're going to talk about what are some ways that you can develop a wider intimacy with God outside of the structure of church community? What are some ways that you can develop a wider intimacy with God outside of the structure of the church community? I gave you some suggestions Come up with some that are in your life, relevant for your life. And then what I want you to do is pray. Pray for that person to have a wider intimacy outside of your sanctuary. Pray that regardless of what they experienced before, that retreat or that you know, um, really powerful encounter, pray that every single day we will be able to commit and connect with God regardless of how we feel. So again, three minutes, uh, six minutes, three minutes 
for each section, and then we'll come back afterward and close out together. Well, praise God. Hopefully, you, again, you had a good time just ministering unto one another. And I know that you know, these times might be short, but especially in your life groups, if you just feel like there's a need after the Sunday celebration is over, just to continue to pray for one another, you realize that there wasn't just enough time. And that, that always happens, right? When you're praying on your own, it's like, ah, uh, it's so hard to pray longer. But when you're praying with people, we can spend more time and, and open up those opportunities, create those spaces to be able to do that. And I think it will really be a benefit for your relationship. So as we talked about, we saw how we need a deeper intimacy. Uh, we need a, a wider intimacy. And the last one is that we need a longer intimacy, a longer intimacy. Let's finish by reading the the. Next couple of verses, uh, verses 5 through 8, Psalm 63. It says, My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, and your right hand upholds me. And so we see here that Remember, back in verses 1 through 4, it talked about how David, he was in dry and weary land. But then all of a sudden, his soul who was thirsting, his soul who was yearning, in verse 5, what happens? He says, my soul will be satisfied with fat and rich food. So something changed. Something changed. And the question is, why? Or rather, the question is, when? When did it change? And David answers that question in verse 6. When? It's when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. I want to read that in the New Century Version. Uh, It says, I remember you while I'm lying in bed, and I think about you through the night. And so David, what he's saying is, there are the the nighttime in the wilderness, so he's traveling, and it's not just a one-day journey, it's a multiple-day journey, and every time they stop, and the stars are out, and people are going to sleep, what is he doing? He's remembering God. While he's laying down and probably doesn't have a nice bed. He's probably sleeping on a floor or in a tent or something. And not only that, he can't sleep because he's constantly thinking and remembering God throughout the night. My question is, what do you remember right before you go to sleep? Don't, you don't have to share with anyone. What is it that you remember before you go to sleep? It's like, what do I have to do the next day? Uh, what are my priorities? What are the struggles that I'm going through? Do you remember God? brothers, this can be even sisters, some of you, what are you doing right before you go to sleep? You're texting that person. You're texting that person and and you're giving off weird signals and you're not even using WhatsApp. You've moved to Signal because that's more secure, more private and you're becoming a little bit shady. This is a side note. Don't be shady. Because it's in those times, right before you got about to go to sleep, you love saying that good night. It's because what is that communicate to that person it means at the very end of the day the last thing that you're thinking about is that person trying to give those subtle hints brothers be in the light don't be in the darkness don't do that at night I mean don't do it during the day either but just be upfront and honest that's that's a whole relationship seminar we'll do that in the coming month but what is it that you do? And whatever it is that you do right before you go to bed or as you're going to bed, those are the things that are most precious and most important to you. And David demonstrates that God is the one who's the most precious and important to you. He's constantly thinking about God all night, all throughout the night. And the problem for us is that we can't even stay awake to pray for more than five minutes, 10 minutes at most. Jesus, he exemplified this. And he would constantly go out to pray all night. Luke 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 12 says, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. All night. And this is not the only time he would constantly do this over and over. You see, throughout the gospel accounts, he would just do this constantly over and over and over again. Why? It was because it was, In that time, that was the most intimate moments that someone has, and it's with God. It is with God. And this is the this is what that kind of intimacy produces, that long intimacy, that long persevering intimacy. What do we see that it produces in verse seven? It says, For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings, what? 
I will sing for joy. It's that long intimacy that produces real, lasting joy. When's the last time you prayed long enough that after you prayed, you were, you were, you know what happens. You pray for about five minutes, maybe six minutes, and then around the sixth or seventh minute, what happens? You run out of things to pray. And usually that first five or six minutes is just you rattling off all these things that you know you're supposed to pray, but you don't really feel anything. I'm wondering, when's the last time you persevered to say, God, I will not stop praying until I, you meet me, until you bless me, until I encounter you, until I just feel this fullness and this sense of joy. When was the last time you did this? God, I will not let go of you. That was Jacob's prayer in Genesis. God, do not let me go until you bless me. When was the last time we wrestled with God to pray? As long as it took, we persevered because we wanted God more than anything else and we were desperate for that joy. It doesn't happen overnight and I, this has been something that's a struggle for myself personally. And I remember that any time I felt frustrated or stressed, what would I usually turn to? I would turn, I would pray for a little bit, but then I would turn to video games. And I, I blame my mom for this. Uh, we're, our family's really into tennis and she started playing this, because you, you know, with the pandemic, it's harder to go outdoors and play. So she started playing this game called Tennis Clash. And she got me into Tennis Clash. And it's this mobile app game where you just literally just swipe to hit the ball. And then anytime I would start to feel stressed, I'll pray a little bit, but then I'll be like, oh, uh, you know, whenever you feel stressed, you want to do something that just numbs your brain. I would just go to that and just like, oh, yes, I can collect more coins and get more, uh, more equipment and upgrade my character. And then lo and behold, I would do that on my bed, right, while Erica's passed out. And then she's like, why are you still awake? I'm like, nothing, I'm not doing anything. I'm playing tennis clash. And I realized like two hours goes by. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've been playing for two hours when I could have spent that time praying. And I realized I feel more drained more tired, and I wake up the next morning, I regret that so much. And until I was uh, with our intercessory prayer team, we were reading this book uh, by Tim Keller called Prayer. And one of the chapters, it really challenged me to say, make God your priority in, in the perseverance of prayer. And he said, just take a psalm. If you can't focus, take a psalm, meditate through it. And I've shared this many times before, but I started and I just committed to say, God, I want to read one psalm a day. I want to meditate on it and allow that to fuel my prayer. And no matter how long it takes, I want to pray until I can just feel your presence and know that you're with me. And after some time, and, and it's not any boast for myself, but I just felt like God allowed me to, to start encountering him. Like, it weaned me off the addiction for tennis class. I deleted it, and praise God, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> but it's so different now. Any, anytime I'm struggling or I feel burnt out, what do I go? I go to that psalm. And God restores me. He renews me. That's what Psalm 23 is all about. We love that psalm. It's the shepherd that lays me down by streams of living water. That's the meditation on who he is, the perseverance. And no matter how long it takes, I want, to, I want to know you. If it takes all night, I want to know you. I'm wondering when the last time we were, that, that we were able to do that. And I just remember, it's not up there. There's a quote by Martin Luther that says, Something about like, I have so much to do today. I'm so busy today that I need to spend three hours in prayer. How many of us, we've ever had that attitude? There's so many things going on that I need to persevere in prayer because without the joy that God gives to me, I could not get through that. Um, there's a, another missionary, uh, George Mueller, back in uh, the olden days. He was a German missionary to the UK and uh, really, really famous for his work with orphans. But one of the things that he's most famous for is prayer. And I want to encourage some of you to read his autobiography or read some of the works on him. And you're just blown away by his intensity of prayer and how he really seeks to prove that prayer can accomplish anything. And one of the things I love uh, that he says here, uh, it's, it's uh, from a book that's quoted by another person who writes on him. He says this, It is not enough for the believer to begin to pray nor to pray correctly, nor is it enough to continue to pr for a time to pray. We must, we must patiently, believingly continue in prayer until we obtain an answer. Further, we have not only to continue in prayer until the end, but we have also to believe that God does hear us and will answer our prayers. Most frequently, we fail in not continuing in prayer until the blessing is obtained and in not expecting the blessing. 
Those who are disciples of the Lord Jesus should labor with all their might in the work of God as if everything depended on their own endeavors. Yet, having done so, they should not in the least trust in their labor and efforts, nor in the means that they use for the spread of the truth, but in God alone. And they should with all earnestness seek the blessing of God in persevering, patient, and believing prayer. Here is the great secret of success, my Christian reader. Work with all your might, but never trust in your work. Pray with all your might for the blessing in God, but work at the same time with all diligence, with all patience, with all perseverance. Pray then and work. Work and pray. And still again, pray, then work. And so on. All the days of your life, the result will surely be abundant blessing. Whether you see much fruit or little fruit, such kind of service will be blessed. Man, that's an incredible thought. And I'm wondering how many of us, we have that attitude toward prayer. Where we don't give up at the slightest inconvenience or just because there's a lack of feeling, but we persevere patiently. We pray. And as hard as we work, I I know in Hong Kong, we're a hardworking culture. We're a hardworking culture. And if you would apply that same hard work to your prayer life, what amazing blessings would come out. What amazing answers would you have to your prayers? Work hard, pray hard, whatever it is that you want to do, you know, make a mantra for yourself. Let's pray and let's devote ourselves to this prayer life, this longer intimacy with God that will last for a long time. And I want to challenge us, when you're up late at night and you want to give into something, do you go to video games? Do you go to Netflix? Do you go to Tennis Clash? Do you go to other stuff? YouTube videos of cats or airplanes or things like that. Go to prayer. Do the work of prayer. And I really believe God is going to transform it. And one thing I want to mention here is we have the One Desire Fast coming up. And many were like, oh my God, what? I don't have to do this fast. And that's our initial attitude. But I'm wondering if we would shift that and say, wow, God, this is such an opportunity for me to persevere in prayer. This is such an opportunity for me to challenge myself, to connect with God no matter how hard it is. And I want to challenge myself that it will cause me to yearn for prayer. And many of you, this is the danger, is when we fast, especially if you're going to do like one meal a day, this is your thought. I know you don't think this consciously, but subconsciously, oh, praise the Lord, I have more time to do other stuff. But that completely defeats the whole purpose of the fast. What you need to do is you need to take those times you would have eaten, that you would have gone out to go get food, and reserve that time for prayer. Imagine you usually use those time, you have a great one and a half hour meet up, lunch with your colleague or a friend, but instead you take that hour and a half and you devote that to prayer. I wonder what would happen in our church if we all did that. It would transform our church. It would transform the city. It would transform this whole area. We would reach the bold vision like that. But it starts with us persevering and having this longer intimacy with God. Let's just close out with the last three verses. I'm going to read verses 9 to 11. It says, But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. And all who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. I think just one thing I want to mention is that we notice that now David, his whole mindset is changed. In the beginning, he's saying, oh God, my God, I, I earnestly seek you. I'm in a dry and weary land. There's this enemy who's pursuing me. And at the end, verse 9, we see what intimacy does. Your whole mindset changes. You have a confidence. Now David knows that those who seek his life, they're not going to amount to anything. That he is going to be able to rejoice in God. And he's going to know that all those liars and all those people who are slandering him, they're going to be stopped. The question for us, is that do we have that kind of confidence? Where can we as believers get that kind of confidence? And our confidence doesn't come from physical deliverance. For David, it happened that way. We can't bank on that. I can't promise you that your work is somehow going to give you a 10-time bonus this year. So where does your confidence come from? Our confidence and our intimacy with God comes because Jesus demonstrated that intimacy with God is greater than any deliverance than anything else in this world. It's the intimacy that Jesus had with His Father, with God, our Heavenly Father, that now we are intimate with God and Christ and the Holy Spirit that gives us that lasting hope. 
And this is the hope because Jesus himself was delivered. He demonstrated this himself. That intimacy is far greater than anything else. In Matthew 16, verse 21 to 26, I'll read this. It says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Isn't that amazing? Is that when we cannot have the mind of God, when we are not intimate with God, who is intimate for us? It is Christ. And His intimacy demonstrated how in the most powerful way by going to the cross, dying for the sins that we should have paid. We weren't intimate with God. We ran away from God. We disregarded God. We were fickle in our relationship with God. And for every reason, God has every right to disown us. His wrath has every right to just come upon us and separate us from God. But what did Jesus do? He said, I am going to be intimate with God for you on your behalf. Because you do not have the mind of God. You do not have the concerns of God, human concerns. But I have God's concerns. And if you would trust in me, And if you would believe that I am here for you, you will put your faith into me, then you will have this intimacy with me and with God our Father and the Holy Spirit that will transform your life. And I pray that that would be the intimacy that we're able to develop with God ourselves every single day. So just a reminder that the one thing from this morning is that intimacy with God through prayer provides the power to overcome anything we encounter. I want to just give us a couple next steps, some practical things. I know I I gave some suggestions throughout the message, but just a couple practical things for us to respond with. The first is consistently schedule a time to spend with God in prayer. I think the biggest thing is that so many of us were like, oh yeah, let me commit to spending time with God, but we never set a time to do it. The best thing that you can do is set a consistent time every single day. Say, no matter what, I'm going to spend this time with God. Don't schedule it when you can have meetings. Don't schedule it when uh, you're going to be interrupted Schedule at a time that you know you're always available. Early in the morning, right before you go to bed, maybe at meal times that you usually have, or maybe you have a consistent break at work. Schedule that time and say, God, every single day I'm going to set this time aside from you and start there. Second one, consciously pray throughout your day. Consciously pray throughout your day. And this is something that's hard for us. Many of us, we're not used to it. We feel like prayer is only something you do in life group, Prayers only do something after a Sunday. But you could pray at any time, anywhere on the MTR. You could pray at your workplace. You don't have to pray out loud all the time. You can pray in your mind. Sometimes it's helpful. You could write out your prayers. Consciously pray throughout the day because it's that connection with God that really helps us. The third one is change your habits to be centered around prayer. Change your habits to be centered around prayer. I think the social media fast is going to be great for many of you. Because your habit, anytime you're stressed, frustrated, something triggers you, what do you go to? You go to that, Instagram. You go to Netflix. You go to all those things to make yourself feel better and numb yourself. But I want to challenge us, change your habit. Center around prayer. Let that trigger cause you to go to a psalm. Let that trigger cause you to go to prayer. Let that trigger cause you to message your accountability partner to say, hey, can you just pray for me? Because I'm just really struggling right now. Change your habits. Create good habits that will allow you to go to prayer in those moments. And lastly, fourth thing, is commit to participating in the One Desire Fast. Commit to participating in the One Desire Fast. And as Pastor Seth mentioned uh, just earlier, that we're going to start this on next Sunday, January 24th. But the problem is if you do not prepare, you're not going to be ready and you're going to be like, well, it's too late. Start now. Prepare now. Think through certain things that you want to pray for. Come up with two or three or four just prayer requests, some for yourself, some for other people around you that you want to be concerted and praying for. And then also come up with what are you going to fast from before Sunday rolls around. Decide, what am I going to fast from? Is it going to be one meal a day? Is it going to be liquids? Is it going to be social media? You should define social media. If you, you don't think social, YouTube is social media, I don't know what to <laughs> say to you. If you're always going to YouTube, then that's probably something that you should probably take out of your life. For me, I, I have, I'm very weird in this way. Uh, reading the news, 
that's something I go to. So what I'm going to be fasting from is limiting my consumption of news articles because I know when it's bad is when I read every single news article that I see on the feed. And so whatever that is for you, find a way, commit to participating in the One Desire Fast. We're going to do this together as a whole church, as a family of churches, and also within your life group. So with that, what we're going to do is we're just going to close out with some worship. And I want to challenge us as we worship, let's not just sing the lyrics, but let's make it our prayer. And let's just ask God as we're praying, God, please, and as we're singing, God, allow me to connect with you. Let me go deeper. Let me go wider. Let me go longer in my intimacy with you this coming season. So let's worship and we'll close out together. That's, uh, that's my prayer for all of us, that all of life, all of our lives would be to know Him in an intimate way. That as we know Him in an intimate way, that will really allow us to then allow so many other people to make Him known, to make God known. Every corner of society, every sphere, every classroom, every workplace, every home, every dormitory, that this intimacy with God would be the thing that glues all, everything that we're aspiring for together and would help us through this next year. And so let me just pray for us, pray a prayer of blessing over us, uh, even as David prayed, uh, that we earnestly seek Him and then we'll uh, conclude today. So Father, we thank you. And we're just praying. I'm just praying for each and every single brother and sister, family, single adult, college student, um, every single person, child in our church that you love and you care for and you desire and, and you have said, I have made you mine. And at the same time, you desire so much for us to say that you are my God, you are our God. And Lord, I pray that you would allow us to develop a deep relationship with you, a wide relationship with you, a long relationship with you where we will persevere and yearn for you no matter what we feel, no matter what situation that we're in. And that as we experience that and as we come up to the One Desire Fast starting next week, that our intimacy would go so much deeper, so much wider, and so much longer. And that as we do that, we would experience transformation we've never seen before. We would grow stronger, more secure, and more of a brighter light even as we shine out this light to all nations, to all people around us. And we thank you for that privilege. We thank you for just the graciousness that you've given as you set the example through Jesus Christ and that intimacy that he had with the Father, that we would emulate that, we would experience that for ourselves. So we thank you so much for this time. And we pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Harvest Mission Community Church Podcast. For more information, visit our website at hongkong.hmcc.net.